I'm Jim Haskell, editor of the Bridgewater Daily Observations. An all-important topic on investors' minds these days is the issue of inflation. As it relates to portfolios, the question is whether stocks and bonds can be relied upon to adequately diversify each other in the event of a sustained upward inflation surprise. This is a very important topic because it challenges the basic premise at the heart of many portfolios, that stocks and bonds are likely to be negatively correlated and therefore natural diversifiers, just as they've been over the past few decades. To discuss the cause and effect dynamics at play, I'm pleased to be joined by senior portfolio strategist Jeff Gardner. We explore why stock bond correlations may be unstable going into the future, the risk that poses to strategic asset allocations, and how investors might think about protecting their portfolios in a world where bonds may be less diversifying to stocks. We hope you enjoy the conversation. So let me start with what, what I think is one of the big questions that is sort of out in the marketplace today among our clients. It's also you hear it about as it pertains to risk parity strategies. And this is the notion that the sort of inverse correlation that we've seen between stocks and bonds, particularly at points of environmental change where growth is changing or inflation is changing, that those may no longer apply that stocks and bonds could be positively correlated on a going forward basis, and that it has big implications for portfolios, and it's really important to understand. So my question to you is, help us understand how to think about this potential issue. Is it something to worry about? Is it not something to worry about? Like, How should I think about that issue? Yeah, absolutely. So when we, when we think about the relationship of stocks and bonds, I think the first point to say is that largely we think of correlations as reflecting more the outcome as opposed to the actual underlying drivers. In other words, the reason that correlation is itself not stable for stocks and bonds is because different kinds of economic environments will create different relationships between stocks and bonds themselves. And so thinking about the correlation as the main variable to drive your diversification, the real problem with that is you have to know what the environment's going to look like to know what the correlation is. And in essence, then that is, is, is it, it is a very unstable thing to bet on with regards to your portfolio as the key way to protect and diversify uh, against equities. That's the underlying kind of problem that we would think about. And then the second piece of that is, is you really have to dig into the drivers. When you do that, I think what you start to see is there will naturally be times when they're negatively correlated and naturally be times when they're positively correlated. And those come from the underlying environment itself. So we don't think there is such a thing as the correlation between stocks and bonds. We think there's a range of outcomes you would expect based on whatever the economic situation is. And importantly, one, one last qualification to that last point around the economic situation is it's really the surprises in the economic situation that matter to asset prices, not the absolute level of growth or inflation. So it's not whether growth is, in, is high or low, inflation is high or low. It's what the surprise is in growth or inflation relative to what was already thought would be the case by the markets. And so in other words, whatever the reaction of the assets is, will be largely to there being a surprise on the growth side, a surprise on the inflation side. So with that put aside, let me then just say, um, when we think about stocks and bonds, then it's primarily, we think of there are certain environments that create a positive correlation. And what we actually lived through for a very long period of time from largely the end of World War II, uh, essentially up until the 1990s, was more of a positive correlation between stocks and bonds. The big reason for that was inflation was the actual big driver and the most, the most um, significant variable factor, if you will, in terms of its drivers that affected both stocks and bonds. And inflation tends to affect them in a similar way. For both assets, they tend to be hurt by a rise in inflation and helped by a decline in inflation. And so we think of them as naturally falling inflation assets. Um, on the opposite side, though, if we look at the 1990s into the 2000s, inflation basically stabilized at very low levels and there wasn't a lot of movement in inflation. And what happened then is that growth actually became much the more the bit more significant and, and bigger changer in terms of the drivers underlying both stocks and bonds. So as we look at that, what happens then when you have growth being the big driver is really growth, a surprise to the upside for growth will be good for stocks, but bad for bonds. So you get a negative correlation in that kind of environment. And then I think, you know, obviously you can also have cross environments where, for example, you might have um, strong growth, but rising inflation. And so that could be an environment where the growth 
the growth might be a bigger deal for the equities than the inflation rising, for example. Um, and that could be both both be very bad for bonds. So that can create a, a negative correlation in that kind of circumstance as well. So it's really, but that at the end of the day, it's just that configuration of circumstances that matter. And then the last thing that creates a positive correlation between stocks and bonds would be the movements of risk premiums and discount rates. And they affect both, both equities and bonds the same. And so if you have a rise in risk premiums or discount rates, or if you have a fall in, in risk premiums or discount rates, and that's the most important thing happening, that also will tend to create a positive correlation between stocks and bonds. Jeff, can you uh, just go a little bit deeper into the question of why stocks and bonds are negatively correlated in a changing growth environment, but positively correlated, at least most of the time, in a changing inflation environment? Yeah, so I think on when we look at a growth environment, you know, you know, the important thing about looking at at stocks and bonds is there's kind of two aspects to the pricing. There's what happens to cash flows, and then there's there's the discounting that happens to prices, right? And so um, when we when we think about the growth environment, let's for, first focus on just thinking about cash flows. Obviously, bonds, the cash flows don't change regardless of the environment. So you get the same cash flows, whether growth is weak or strong. But for equities, you know, the cash flows are not fixed. And so they have a significant driver, which will be growth itself. And so if growth goes up, it tends to mean higher revenues and higher revenues. If you can keep your margins stable, of course, are higher earnings and you might even be able to expand your margins and get even more earnings from that. So there, there tends to be a, a leverage kind of effect on, er, on earnings that really means the cash flows you get from an equity are much higher in a better growth environment and lower in a, in a weak growth environment. And of course, that makes the bonds less attractive in an environment where growth is picking up, and it makes them relatively more attractive in an environment where growth is weakening. And you see shifts of flows towards or away from those assets based on what's happening with the growth environment. So it's very anchored in the underlying characteristics of the assets themselves, which are those characteristics, um, uh, especially at the aggregate level, really anchor themselves in the macro drivers of the economy. And then so turning to inflation, if we take those same perspective of thinking through how the cash flows are affected by an inflationary environment, you know, I think first, let's start with bonds. Yeah, I think it's very clear when you look at an asset that has fixed cash flows, if inflation goes up, the actual value of the cash flows that you receive from bonds goes down. And so bonds are, are very strongly a, an asset that does better in a, in a falling inflation environment than a rising inflation environment. Falling inflation, enhancing the value of the returns, rising inflation, really deteriorating the, the, the value of the returns of a bond. When you look at equities, that picture is less clear. I would not say it's nearly as, as clear cut as it is for bonds. But in essence, there's a couple of key things to really talk about, which is it's not that clear that equities benefit that much from inflation when it comes through to, the, to things like earnings and margins. And they certainly have the potential for it either to help margins or hurt margins. The nature of the company depend, you know, is also going to depend upon how, how well they react to the nature of inflation. But the thing that is actually most clear, even for equities, is that the, the literal discounting effect itself of rising interest rates. Um, when you take an equity and you think about cash flows way out in the future, as the discount rate faces upward pressure in a rising in, in a rising inflationary environment, that's going to actually hurt the value of these cash flows way out in the future for equities, which are not that clearly going to be offset by being able to pass that through in the earnings. And so the consequence of that is when we look at returns of equities. And importantly here, I think that, that what we would also emphasize to people is you really want to look at the excess returns of equities over cash to see this effect. But when you look at the excess returns of equities over cash in inflationary environments, especially big surges in inflation, it's pretty clear that they underperform their long-term performance um, on, on net over lots of those different kinds of environments. Um, the degree of that underperformance varies a little bit. It has something probably to do with the nature of the inflationary environment and the, and the nature of the actual companies in the index at the time. But nevertheless, we see this as a relatively clear influence where I would say rising inflation tends to be bad for equities in a way that's similar to, be, to, how, to being bad for bonds. And hence, both of them behave much more similarly with regards to inflation shocks, whereas they actually are very diversifying to each other with regards to growth shocks. And of course, when you look at through history, those relationships, you look at those changes, they're really quite reliable. It's, it's amazing how, quite, how reliable they are. 
You mentioned that uh, from largely the end of World War II up through the 1990s, there was more of a positive correlation between stocks and bonds, and that this was driven by conditions that, you know, inflation surprises, which create that positive correlation happening more than growth surprises, which typically result in a negative correlation. How can you have such a long period where inflation surprises were so much more common than growth surprises? Well, it's, it, I think it's really about the significance of the variations in it that matter a lot, Jim. You know, And so it's not to say like there were zero periods in that whole environment after World War II, all the way up to the 1990s, that growth didn't, wasn't the more important thing. It's just as a broad characterization, you would say generally what we saw was more positive correlations because the, the variable that surprised the most and had the biggest deviations really was um, inflation. And so it, it was on a secular trend up. And then in the 1980s, the secular trend reversed. And especially that big decline in the 1980s also created a positive correlation. It was generally very good for both assets, even if, as it was more of a headwind for both assets in the previous period. So it's more, more about how significant the surprise is. And then when inflation became very stable, you know, what was interesting about that is that, that's, that, that what that really does is it allowed growth to be the, the variable that was moving around and moving around even reasonably normally. But now all of a sudden that matters a lot more because the inflation itself was so stable. So it's sort of like the relative impact of the two things that really, really ends up uh, helping to determine what the correlation will be. We talked about how growth has been the dominant driver of the relationship between stocks and bonds in recent history. But now we're in an MP3 world where bond yields are very low across developed economies, short rates are zero or negative, and fiscal policy is the primary economic lever for policymakers. And this combination changes how responsive bonds can be to growth and also is creating real inflationary pressures. So in this new world, how should we think, Jeff, about the future of the relationship between stocks and bonds? And particularly, how diversifying bonds will be to equity-heavy portfolios. Yeah, well, I think there's a there's uh, there's of course different countries which are very different spots, and so the situations will vary uh, based on on those underlying circumstances. But you know, as as we look at the nature of that of that challenge, I, I think that the 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 first starting point is to say that it's much less clear that that growth will be the dominant influence, and there is definitely more possibility of inflation in this world. And so as what I think people are coming from is they're coming from a a context in which they're so used to bonds being the primary diversifier to equities. And that's because we've lived in for quite a while, a period where they were negatively correlated to each other because growth was the big driver. And so what's important here is it may be that that continues, or it might be that inflation becomes the bigger driver, or we might have to worry about liquidity and the overall liquidity picture and its impact on risk premiums. And it's actually probably even more so than we faced in, in most recent times here, a much less certain picture of what the future is going to look like. And so when we think about that, you know, I would say the, it could, be, could very well be that the relationships continue to look much like we've experienced in the past. But there's also a lot of possibility here that, that you see, number one, bonds being a much less good diversifier to equities either because the rates are so low that the bonds really can't rally a lot and provide a lot of protection, or because you get a surge in inflation, which would be both bad bad for bonds and bad for the stocks. And it's in that kind of world where you know our way of thinking about this would be to say, bonds and stocks are two very good assets. And we certainly have, have always um, really thought about those as a, as a core part of a portfolio. But there's other assets we also think about as being a core part of the portfolio, which help to fill these gaps. And in particular, we would be looking at adding um, inflation hedge assets here today, not because there's a certainty that we're going to get inflation, but because the risk of that associated with the, un- the, the nature of the COVID shock, but also importantly, the paradigm shift into where we're really in a very different policy world now with MP3, as you said, being the main the main policy lever that exists, that creates a, a different set of potential outcomes and, and higher inflation is absolutely one of those outcomes we would be worried about today. And so by holding more assets that provide inflation protection, you can be okay, even if the stocks and bonds correlation shifts around. You mentioned periods of tightening liquidity, and that's another case where the correlation of stocks and bonds is, of course, positive. 
So what can investors do in cases like that to protect themselves? There is the world where no assets do well, and that's an environment of a tightening of liquidity or a rise in risk premiums. And it's for that reason that we've always thought that alpha has a, has a significant role in, in people's portfolios to the degree you believe you, you can find good alpha managers. You know, alpha is really the thing that can make money when everything else goes down. And so that's, that's, the, that's the last piece of the overall puzzle that I would put together uh, for thinking about how to, how to deal with this environment. But the last comment I'd maybe make on this too, Jim, is just to say that um, it's why we emphasize diversification so much is the uncertainty of where we are today, the changing of the dynamics of, of moving into an MP3 policy world and the uncertainty that comes with that. And what people have largely positioned their portfolios for is a continuation of that disinflationary uh, period. And so what they're particularly vulnerable to would be a turn in inflation and, a, and, and inflation becoming a much bigger problem from an economic perspective. Um, when you look at all that, all that and then also cast it against some of the big secular issues that have accumulated over a long period of time, it looks to us like this is a very uncertain point in time. And diversifying across assets, stocks, bonds, and other types of assets like inflation hedge assets, together with alpha, is probably the, the, the thing that gives you the highest likelihood of doing well, regardless of what the outcomes turn out to be. Let me follow up a little bit on your point about the need for investors to prepare for a potentially inflationary environment that would hurt their equity-heavy portfolios, especially because bonds are unlikely to diversify stocks in that sort of environment. Now, you mentioned inflation-sensitive assets, such as you know inflation index bonds, gold, maybe other commodities, the, perhaps that these can replace nominal bonds in some way and help provide that protection. So can you say more about that? Yeah, it, it, for the same reasons we talked about with stocks and bonds, um, it's just that the natures of the cash flows of those assets are different and that they're assets that benefit more in an inflationary environment. And it's important to say inflation is not a one homogenous thing. There's, there's different kinds of inflation you can face. They're largely a reflection of whatever the supply de demand balance is of money and spending and, and um, the availability of goods and so on and so forth. But you know, as you as you look at that, I would just say, like, think about gold. Gold is really more of a currency than an, than an asset. Maybe as a way to think about it, it doesn't have a long term expected positive real return. We would largely say it's probably a zero real return over a very long period of time. But what it does particularly well in protecting a portfolio against is periods where you have significant amounts of monetary inflation, because that's when currencies are most at risk. Um, there's other types of commodities which will both have have more of a connection to the underlying economy, and so they'll both have a growth sensitivity, but they'll also be, tend to be protective assets in a world of inflation, either because they cause the inflation, um, such as we saw with the oil shocks in the 1970s, or because they reflect that people are looking for things that have a more intrinsic value like commodities do. And so they'll move into commodities during those periods from a flows perspective. And so those are a couple of ways to think about it. Inflation index bonds, as you also mentioned, you know, we think inflation index bonds are a great asset. They're, they're a, essentially a promise by the government to protect you against a certain kinds of inflation, which is CPI inflation. And for most people, CPI inflation is a lot of what they care about. And so getting a stated real return um, over and above inflation is, a, is, of course, a very attractive prospect normally. In today's world, I think what most people would realize is that the yields are negative. But the, the important thing to realize is the reactions of inflation-linked bonds can still very much help to protect your portfolio. In other words, negative yields don't prevent inflation-linked bonds from rallying, especially on a relative perspective compared to nominal bonds in a world where you had an inflation shock. And so they would definitely be much better to hold than things like nominal bonds if you went into that world. Um, so that's another, another thing to think about. And then, of course, those are just the public assets. There's also private assets many of which can also have inflation hedging characteristics. So, you know, we would look broadly across a lot of different ways of getting inflation protection. Um, but I do think it's an important thing to be thinking about in, time, in the context of your portfolio today, especially in light of the, the environment that we are now in. In terms of your thinking about, you know, what drives the correlations, the underlying environments, and then we've been talking also about how to protect yourself in the MP3 type of world. Um, how does this relate to some of Bob's thinking on um, you know, further steps that you can take to eliminate environmental bias in your portfolio? 
Well, it's a, it's a really uh, been an interesting area of research. I've actually um, been working a bit with Bob on, on some things related to that. And that, um, you know, what I think the basic point here is that in many ways, what we have talked to clients about for a very long period of time, and the main thing we've really been talking about in this discussion today is just this point that you can hold assets that naturally balance each other. And of course, that's one way to get to a more consistent returns over time. And ultimately, that's the thing we think is most valuable in investing is consistency of returns. Because at the end of the day, when you look at long-term wealth creation, there is both the return piece, but there's also how bad are the down periods or the drawdowns you experience along the way. The bigger and deeper the, the drawdowns, it takes you a lot longer to tend to get out of those. And really, that's a big interruption in your long-term wealth accumulation. So that's a big deal. And so the, the, as we've thought about for a long time with all weather, balancing assets that naturally do well when other parts of your portfolio are struggling is a, um, is a really effective way to create much more consistency of returns. But the second point that Bob's been digging into and thinking a lot more about is just maybe there's ways to actually create assets that themselves have less bias in the first place. And that's the core thing I would just isolate here is that assets as they exist today come with biases, strong, significant biases that persist. And, and as you noted, Jim, you know, those are those are very reliable back through through history. You see it over and over again across countries and across time. But, you know, as you think about those biases, those biases are a function of the nature of the way the assets relate to the environment. Is it possible to create assets that naturally have less bias? And so that's what he's been thinking about. And, and one example that we've already discussed with people is this idea of creating a more stable cash flow version of, of an equity portfolio. And naturally, what that does is it has less growth sensitivity. And as a consequence of that, you, ne you need to worry less about having things like bonds to balance against the bad times for that portfolio, just because the bad times are a lot less bad in the first place, right? And so, and then doing some other things around that, we can also add some hedges to deal with the fact that there would still be residual inflation sensitivity. And the consequence of that is you can build a more consistent, reliable return stream by starting with something then that has less bias inherent in it. And that's that's the underlying concept, and um, you know it's it's something we think actually is is pretty broadly applicable, and is potentially a new way to be thinking about portfolio construction um, relative to just even the approaches we've used for a very long period of time. But I would describe it as an evolution of it, where it's another another stage and taking advantage of another layer in which to actually create better diversification in your portfolios by digging inside the asset in addition to looking at diversification across assets. Jeff, thanks so much for your time. Looking forward to having you back real soon. Thanks, Jim. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure and really enjoyed it.